Good morning. I want to welcome you to the Covenant Church. I'm Pastor Paul Bradford. It's wonderful having you all here today. It is Memorial Day weekend. We're celebrating Memorial Day and remembering those who fought and died for our nation. Uh, but it's also a very important Sunday in the church here. It's Pentecost Sunday. On Pentecost Sunday, we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And uh, we'll be talking about that during the sermon today. And finally, it's uh, our Sunday where we celebrate our graduates. And so we'll have, in a little bit, have our graduates come forward to uh, receive a gift and uh, to receive a blessing. So a lot of things that are happening today. Uh, if uh, you're new to us, we'll take our offering uh, after our worship set. Uh, but uh, you can also give online. And there's instructions about that in your bulletin. You can also give in the back of the sanctuary as you leave. So uh, just take note of that. And there's other announcements in your bulletin that you'll want to read. So always read through those because there's things that will be relevant to you today. We want to honor our graduates. So we want to invite forward our uh, four high school graduates, Nick Nicholas Chase, Tyler Rus Russo, Anna Hudson, uh, Emmett Godin, and Lillian Seralt. Oh, actually... <laughs> These are high school get graduates. Uh, Lillian is a college graduate. I do not believe that she's here today. Lillian, if you are, let me know right away. But uh, so, orange and black. It's a big day. Congratulations to all of you. It's a very pivotal day in your life. Uh, this is kind of like a rite of passage in American society when you graduate from high school. You've, you've been adults already, but in a real sense, you are going to have a greater degree of independence. We're never fully independent, are we? We're always dependent upon other people, our friends, our family, uh, as we walk through life. But there's a way in which you're going to be responsible for your own decisions as never before, and you need wisdom to make the right decisions before the Lord, uh, to do what's right, to make good choices that will benefit your life and the life of those that you love. Not, not one of us live alone. We, have, we impact those around us. So you're on a, a very important journey, and we need God's wisdom you need God's strength. There's so many things out there that can lead us astray, that can cause us to stumble. And so uh, we need God's grace. And so I want to encourage you, stay connected to believers. Like coals, when you're, the coals are gathered together, it keeps us hot. And, uh, it, and if, you're, if you get cool, it'll warm you up in the Lord. And it, it also holds you accountable. So you've got to be with people that are solid believers you also need to spend time with jesus and you need to spend time in god's word because god's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path and we have a, a gift for each of you we have a, a bible and uh kathleen did a lot of research when she picked these out Anna has one that is for women and uh we all have emmet uh you men have one for men, and this is not just a regular Bible. This is a 21st century Bible, all right? You can get an app for free that you can download onto your phone, and you can scan the page number on any page in this Bible, and it'll bring up Bible study notes, maps, songs, devotional ideas for that, those scriptures on that page. Isn't it pretty amazing? So this is a, uh, a high-tech Bible. Uh, <laughs> but you don't have to use your app. Uh, most importantly is, is to read it. I want to pronounce a, a blessing over you. This comes from a, a famous prayer of St. Patrick, the hymn of St. Patrick. But it was put into song by a friend of mine, uh, Dwight Beale. I'm not going to sing it for you. That would not be a blessing. Uh, but I want to proclaim it, these powerful words. Christ be with you and within you. Christ behind you and before. Christ beside you and to win you. Christ to comfort and restore. Christ beneath you and above you. Christ in quiet and in danger. Christ in hearts of all that love you. Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. Christ in resting and in rising. Christ the Lord of all your life. 
Christ to guide you and to shield you. Christ protecting you from strife. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for each of these precious young men and women, Lord, who you so love. And Lord, we ask that as they launch into this new season of life, that you will guard them, that you will guide them, that you will fill them with your Holy Spirit, or that they will be mighty warriors for the Lord Jesus Christ, that you will remove from their lives anything that does not honor you and fill them with the fruit and the gifts of your Holy Spirit, that they might serve you and honor you and walk in your ways, ways that will give them life and prosperity. For, Lord, your way brings life. But, Father, when we wander from your way, it brings death and destruction. So guard them, Lord, and keep them on the path. And Father, we want to thank you, for we know that you are with them. And as they put their trust in you and set their eyes upon you, they can be sure, Lord, that your hand will be with them. And in years to come, as they look back, they will see that you have been there. Lord, give them prosperity. Bless them in the next step in their life, whether that be trade school or college, or, or if they're seeking you for the direction, guide this next journey for them, this next step in the journey. Pray, Father, we pray for, for Lillian Seralt as well, who can't be with us today. She goes into nursing. Bless her. May she touch lives of patience. Father, we give you thanks for all your love, for your faithfulness, and above all, for the salvation we've received in Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Let's congratulate all these. Congratulations. Amen. <laughs> congratulations. Congratulations, Tyler. Nicholas, congratulations. Thank you. You may return to your seats. I know you just loved wearing your uh, robes today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's continue in prayer. <clears throat> Father, how we need you. Lord, we need you. Guide us, Father. And Father, we want to ask that you will... Fill us with your Holy Spirit on this Pentecost Sunday. Lord, uh, give us ever deeper intimacy with you. Fill us with an anointing worship. Lord, heighten our desire and ability to share your gospel. Father, give us a deeper love, joy, and peace. All of these are things that your Spirit gives to us as we open our hearts to you. Lord, we yearn for you to work, to move more greatly in our lives and in our church. And Lord, we renounce all sin in our lives. We, we yield ourselves to you. We say, Lord, take our lives and use us. Lord, rule and even overrule where we're stubborn that we might not miss you. And Lord, we trust in you. We trust that your promise, that you've given your spirit and you'll give us ever more of your spirit as we ask and receive. And so, Lord, we are aware of your presence, that you're speaking, that you're at work. We open our lives to you. Father, be at work in each individual, deepening our walks, illumining our minds to understand your word, strengthening our spirits to resist temptation, filling us with your fruit that we might love others. Lord, uh, anointing us to share the good news, to, to invite people to, to you, and Lord, to invite people to church where they can meet you or to Alpha where they can meet you. Or to a small group where they can be with fellowship of believers. And Father, on this Memorial Day, we want to give you thanks for the people in our 
gathered here today that have served in our armed forces. Lord, we, we hate war. We know you hate war. It's not what we want. But we know that there's evil in the world that needs defense. And brave men and women have, have served and sacrificed. And we're thankful for that, Lord. And we ask your blessing to be upon them and their families. Upon any families that have experienced, or, or individuals that have experienced uh, the, uh, the trauma of war. That's impacted them emotionally or spiritually. Lord, great are you. Work in their lives for healing. Lord, you are good. Your love endures forever. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. To you be glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, traditionally on Memorial Day, we sing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And just take note of this song. It's a really fascinating song. It's written by Julia Ward Howe. Uh, and uh, there's actually, there's a, to this tune, there was a song that the Union soldiers sang that was a little bit crass about uh, John Brown uh, and a revolution that took place, an uh, anti-slavery revolution. And a pastor mentioned uh, when, uh, when Howe was visiting the troops that it might be good for her to rewrite those words. <laughs> and that, morning, that next morning she woke up, it was actually in the middle of the night, and it's like the words were just flowing into her mind. And she jumped up, grabbed her pen, and she said the words just almost flew onto the page. And uh, there it was, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. It's actually using imagery about the coming of the Lord and the judgment of God and intermixing that with the, the call to set the captives free that was upon the Union soldiers. So uh, may we be warriors for Christ. Let's all stand and sing together the battle hymn of the Republic and may we worship the Lord with gladness and come before him with joyful song.
Heavenly Father, you've given us so many riches, the riches beyond our greatest imagination. And so now, Lord, from your own hand, we give back to you these small gifts and ask, Lord, that you will bless these gifts for your service. And Lord, we trust you for your provision in our lives in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give us joy. kids have fun and Lord bless them as they go may they be touched by your word and by your spirit today is Pentecost Sunday as we mentioned earlier and we want to read about the first Pentecost after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as we'll learn it wasn't the first Pentecost Pentecost had been going on for 1500 years but this was the first one after the resurrection of Jesus we read in Acts chapter, first chapter 1, verse 1 to 5, and in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 21. Acts chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came... They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God 
in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. Today is our second sermon in our series, Power from on High. Today our topic is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. It's Pentecost Sunday, the day the church around the world celebrates the coming of the Holy Spirit on the church that took place 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. Pentecost Sunday. Today I want to talk about that amazing day and how it transformed the early followers from a frightened group to a forceful uh, assembly of followers of Jesus that turned the world upside down. History records again and again the Holy Spirit coming in a special way upon men and women, empowering them for the work that God had called them to. One example of this is Dwight Moody, the famous 18th century revivalist preacher. Uh, Moody was a young, driven pastor who lived in Chicago. Uh, by the age of 34, he had grown a church into the thousands, one of the first megachurches in America. They had a sanctuary that sat, tw uh, sat 2,500 people. And he was also the president of the largest YMCA in America back in the day when wives were still young men's Christian associations. Uh, and uh, they, the largest Y was right there in Chicago. But something was missing. And there were two middle-aged women in the congregation who sensed that something was missing. So they began to pray that God might baptize Moody with the Holy Spirit, fill him with the Spirit. Moody got word about this. He, he noticed they were praying during the service. And he was offended. I'm the pastor of this big church. What, you think I'm missing something? But after he got over his offense, he thought, I'm missing something. And he actually began to join with those women in a prayer meeting to pray for the anointing of the Spirit. And specifically, the Spirit to come upon his life. But he struggled to surrender. Actually, God was calling him to a, a nationwide, even a worldwide evangelistic ministry, but Chicago was home, his home, and he was going to stay in Chicago. And it wasn't until the great Chicago fire in 1871 came that he finally surrendered. That fire burnt down his church. It burnt down his home. It burnt down the YMCA. And broken through all this, uh, one day he was in New York City fundraising for the YMCA. And while he was walking down one of the busiest streets in New York City, he is finally, quietly, without a struggle, surrendered himself to the Lord. Whatever you want me to do, Lord, I'm yours. And at once, an overpowering sense of the presence of God flooded his soul. It was so strong, he, he rushed to a nearby home of a friend and asked if he could uh, have a room uh, in the house where he went and locked himself in the room. He fell on the floor and he said, the Lord's love bathed him. Wave after wave. 
And he said later, he wrote this of the experience. Oh, what a day. I cannot describe it. I seldom refer to it. It is almost too sacred an experience to name. I can only say that God revealed himself to me. And I had such an experience of his love that I had to ask him to stay his hand. I went to preaching again. The sermons were not different. I did not present any new truths. And yet hundreds were converted. I would not now be placed back where I was before that blessed experience if you should give me all the world. It would be like dust in the balance. But it's not just great evangelists like Dwight Moody who have had this experience of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Christians across the world and across the ages have experienced the empowerment of the Holy Spirit upon their lives that revolutionized their lives. That filling with the Holy Spirit is accompanied by a greater expression of worship, a deeper understanding of God's word, an empowerment and a desire to reach the lost, a greater manifestation of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in their lives, like love and joy and peace. We all need a fresh anointing, a personal Pentecost in our lives. And for those of us who have experienced mighty touches of the Holy Spirit, we need to be renewed again because we need more and need to be refreshed. And so today, let's look at what God's Word says about that first Pentecost, and then let's look at how we can experience such a personal Pentecost in our lives. And the first thing I want to talk about is a little bit about this Feast of the Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost foreshadowed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost was one of three great feasts that God had, had ordained where all the Jews were required to come together in Jerusalem to worship God. Pentecost was exactly 50 days after the Passover Sabbath. So during Passover week, the Sabbath, they'd count off 50 days. <clears throat> Saturday is, or Sabbath is a Saturday. So Pentecost is always on a Sunday. And on this day, people would come, Jewish pilgrims from across Israel and across the known world would assemble at the break of dawn at the temple. Now the word uh, Pentecost is a Greek word for 50th because it's 50 days after the, uh, the, the Sabbath in the, the uh, Passover week. The whole Old Testament points towards Christ. And likewise, the Feast of Pentecost pointed towards the work of Christ by which he would send his Holy Spirit upon the church. In multiple ways. First of all, through the Holy Spirit, the first fruits of, the, of God's kingdom are given to God's people. Pentecost was the celebration of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. On Pentecost Sunday, at the break of dawn, everyone would bring to the temple area the first fruits of their harvest, whatever that would be. This is for the wheat harvest, but other people might have brought money or other things if they weren't a farmer. And so this was the bringing, uh, giving of thanksgiving for the provision of God. On Pentecost Sunday, the first fruits of the Holy Spirit were given to the church. Paul calls the Holy Spirit, in Romans 8, 23, the first fruits of the new creation. And so for a farmer, when they saw the first fruits of the, the for instance, in this case, a wheat harvest coming in, that was a real presence of the harvest that they, you, you could eat that. But it's also a promise that the rest of the harvest was coming in. And so the sending of the Holy Spirit upon the church was the presence of the future glory that we would receive in the kingdom of God where there will be no more sin or sickness or sorrow or pain coming into the present, real presence of the future but also a promise that the full harvest of glory would come, that the fullness of the new creation would come into our lives. Wherever Jesus went, a little bit of the new creation came, a little bit of heaven came to earth. 
The sick were healed, the, the lame were, could walk, the, Satan was cast out, truth was imparted, salvation came. And through the Holy Spirit, heaven comes to earth through God's church. God's spirit imparts the first fruits of God's kingdom to his people. Next, God's law is placed on the hearts of God's people. According to the Jewish rabbis, the giving of the law to, by God to Moses on Mount Sinai occurred on the day of Pentecost. And so on the day of Pentecost, the people of Israel, when they gathered, would recommit their lives to following the law and to God's covenant. But the problem was, and we see this throughout the Old Testament, because of their weakness, they continually fell again and again and would disobey God's law. Because, see, the problem wasn't them uh, not wanting to. The problem was in the heart. It was a hardness of heart towards God that prevented them from following God's law. It's true for all of us, apart from the Spirit of God. But in Ezekiel 36, 26, the prophet foretold, I will give you, the Lord says, I will give you a new heart and put my new spirit, and put my, a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That promise, the giving of the law unto their hearts, was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. The Jews came to recommit themselves to the law of God on the day of Pentecost. And on that day, God gave them the ability to keep the law. As Paul says in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 3, God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He died for our sins on the cross. Why? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The law is on our heart. The next thing the Holy Spirit does that was done on Pentecost, foreshadowed in the Pentecost celebration, was this. The nations receive God's blessing. On the day of Pentecost, literally one, uh, hundreds of thousands of people from all across the known world gathered together. Our text says that there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Then it lists 16 distinct regions from Libya and Egypt to Rome and beyond. God had told Abraham that through him all nations on earth would be blessed through his seed, that seed is Christ, and that blessing of Christ is now extended to the whole world through the work of the Holy Spirit. Up until this time, the Spirit was available only to Israel and then only in a limited way. But now the Spirit was poured out upon all, all who trusted in God. Thousands came to Jesus that day, and this gospel began to spread First to the nations through the day of Pentecost, but then through the disciples. Because as Jesus said in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And to this day, missionaries are bringing God's word to the ends of the earth. By the way, there are other church, uh, nations that are sending missionaries to America now. Because they see our need. And finally, on the day of Pentecost, God's presence enters his new temple. We expect that the disciples, when the Spirit fell, were actually in one of the rooms. The temple had many rooms, and they were actually in one of those rooms when the Holy Spirit fell. That's why everyone noticed what was going on. The temple in the Old Testament was the place where God's presence dwelt. And now God's presence, Holy, the Holy Spirit's presence, was coming upon God's people. God was, was transferring the locus of his presence from the temple, the physical temple, 
to the spiritual temple, to his people. For the Apostle Paul says that we are the temple of God, for the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Fifteen centuries before the day of this day of Pentecost we're talking about, God established this feast knowing that on the day of Pentecost, he would bring the first fruits of God's kingdom through the Holy Spirit. Through the Spirit, he'd place his law upon our hearts that we might keep it. Through the Spirit, he'd give the blessing of Abraham to all the nations, and he would bring his presence into his new temple, the church of God. None of this was coincidence. God had foreordained from the beginning of time that his son would come, die for our sins, and then 50 days after, the, on the day of Pentecost, he would send his spirit, and the church would be born. And so on that day of Pentecost, on Pentecost, the church received the baptism with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist had prophesied, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Matthew 3.11. And Jesus told his disciples in Acts 1.4, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, we read about this. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit came as wind and fire and water, and filled the other, the early church. These three symbols, the images, wind, fire, and water, are used in the Bible to describe the mighty working of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, the Bible says, came like a mighty rushing wind. Like the wind, the, the Spirit blows where He will, and He must re, be received as He does His sovereign work. He blew as a mighty wind into the open, receptive hearts of the disciples. And he descended as tongues of fire, imparting passion and power and illumination by his Spirit. And the Spirit, Peter, uh, in Acts 2.33, says the Spirit was poured out. Jesus had prophesied about the coming of the Holy Spirit in John 7, 38, when he said, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being will flow streams of living water. And the Bible says he was standing in the temple when he said those words. Here in the temple, the river was being poured out upon the early church and flowing forth from them. The fire of God fell. And 3,000 people were saved that day. The wind was blowing church was ablaze. The living water was flowing forth from them and bringing life and healing. Now, we find in the New Testament that different terms are used to express this mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In Luke 24, 49, it's called being clothed with power from on high. In Acts 1, 4, it's called the promise of the Father. In Acts 1, 5 and 11, 16, it's called the baptism with the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 3, 11, it's called the baptism with fire. In Acts 2, 4, it's called being filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 10, uh, Acts 10, 44 and 45, the Holy Spirit is spoken of as coming upon believers or being poured out upon believers. In Acts 10, 47, it's spoken of as receiving the Holy Spirit. But all these different uses of terminology refer to the same gracious, powerful moving of the Holy Spirit. Now, a couple of important points. First of all, all who believe in Jesus receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, well, people have different terminology for expressing this fullness of the Holy Spirit. But as I study the terminology in the New Testament, it seems to me, and arguments are made for uh, that this is a, is a subsequent work of God through the Holy Spirit. But I'll explain this in a minute. From what I can see, it happens when we're saved 
Peter says in Acts 2.38, repent, referring to what just happened, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it seems evident that Peter is assuming that when they repent and are baptized, they will receive what was just poured out on the church. As I understand in Scripture, if you're a believer today, you have, re- you have been baptized in the Spirit. The gift has been given to you. It's yours. That brings me to another important observation. We need to experience the baptism with the Holy Spirit. In every instance in the Holy Spirit, uh, in Acts, when the Holy Spirit falls, something definite happens. And people clearly knew they had experienced the touch of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they burst forth in praise, there was prophesying, worship, speaking in tongues, experience of changed lives, empowerment to do ministry. So many Christians know the benefits of Christ's death and his resurrection in their lives. But they don't know the experience of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, or at least not as fully as God intends. And we all need the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives in order to live godly lives, in order to to live the way he's calling us to live, to to raise our children, to, to be godly friends, to be a light in the workplace, to have healthy marriages, to be a light in the schools, to reach the lost. We need the Holy Spirit moving through us to stir in us and to work in the lives of others. But the baptism in the Holy Spirit needs to become an experienced reality in our lives. If you're a Christian, it's your birthright. You've received it. You need to receive what is yours already. It belongs to you. And so I I ask you this morning, have you experienced the baptism with the Holy Spirit? It's yours in Christ Jesus. Have you experienced it? And if you have experienced it, are you longing for yet more? An outpour of God's presence and power. I uh, have a friend. His name is Ken Talton. Lives in Detroit. Grew up in the inner city. He got in with the wrong crowd, uh, committed armed robbery, was arrested, and sentenced to seven years in prison. His fourth year in prison, he accepted Christ as his personal Savior. Later, uh, he uh, was talking to a, a fellow inmate about the struggle he was having understanding the Bible. And his friend said, Ken, you need to experience the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And Ken hadn't even heard there was a Holy Spirit. It was about time for prisoner count. And so his friend said, uh, Ken, after count, let's find a place, a private place, and let's pray. And so after count, they went and found a shade tree, got underneath that tree. And his friend began to pray for him. He just placed his hand on Ken's st- stomach and prayed that out of his inmost being would flow rivers of living water. And Ken told me that the presence of the Spirit began stirring deeply. It was far deeper than emotional uh, stirrings or, or something of the intellect. It was from deep within. And joy and praise began to overflow in his life. He began to speak in an unknown language. And he, his friend hadn't even told him about that, about the gift of tongues. And the Spirit just like, was like, he said, like electricity and fire in my body. And the next time he went to read the Bible, suddenly he had illumination and made sense. And he he had a greater experience of God's love and power and presence in his life. And I'll tell you this, Ken, he graduated from high school. He never had any college or beyond. But he understood the Bible more than many of my seminary classmates because of the illumination of the Holy Spirit. He became a pastor in inner city Detroit. He married a lovely woman and now has five children who are following Jesus. We need such an outpour in our lives today to be awakened that we might ourselves change the world. And so what is our response? According to God's 
promises. We can expect these benefits of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so how do we experience this personal Pentecost? The Bible makes clear we need to experience the work of the Holy Spirit to have vibrant spiritual lives. There was a vibrance and a spiritual uh, dynamic, a supernatural dynamic in the early church that's available to us today. And that dynamic brings crucial benefits. Deeper intimacy with God, heightened worship, increased prayerfulness, a greater understanding of God's word, more effectiveness in ministry, a greater boldness in sharing Christ, increase the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. These are all works of the Holy Spirit. And as we talked about last week, the Holy Spirit applies the work of Christ to our lives, enables us to, uh, enables us to receive and experience the work of Christ. And so we need to prepare our hearts to experience the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Last week, we talked about how to position ourselves to experience the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we used the image of a schooner with sails and discussed some principles that apply to opening our, positioning ourselves to uh, move in the Spirit, but they also apply equally to uh, opening ourselves to experience a touch of the Holy Spirit. It's the same Spirit, the same principles. First of all, we need to yearn for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We need to, to thirst for an experience of a, a, a greater empowerment and presence of God in our lives, earnestly desiring more. We need to surrender to God, which includes uh, repenting of all known sins, say, God, take me, I'm yours, I'm yielding my life to you. The Holy Spirit can't be in the same vessel with unrepented sin and rebellion. And we need to trust God. Trust God's promises by asking and believing. Ask for the fullness of the Spirit. Jesus says in Luke eleven thirteen that your Heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. It's a promise. And so when we ask, be expectant to receive. Ask and believe. And then finally, attune by opening your hearts and expecting to experience the Holy Spirit in your life. Just tune in and open. The Spirit's right here, right now. He's been here as we've been preaching, as we've been worshiping. Just be attuned to that and open your life and expect to experience His presence. I want to come before the Lord right now in prayer. And I want to invite everyone to stand. Unless you have physical uh, things that make it hard to stand, that's okay. But let's just stand. And... I encourage you just to open your hands before the Lord in a posture of receptivity. Our, our physical actions can help open us in our inner being. You don't have to do any of this, but, but I want to encourage you. Open your heart. And we want to pray. Lord, we come here today. We yearn for more of you. We're thirsty. We're hungry. Father, we renounce all sin in our lives. And Lord, we know getting free from sin is a process, but we just say right now, just if a sin comes to your mind, I renounce that sin in Jesus' name. I want it out of my life, Lord. And just yield yourself to God. And say, Lord, with the best that I can, I give you all of me. God has promised we ask for the Holy Spirit, we'll receive. And so just say, come Holy Spirit, come upon me. I open my heart to receive. And I trust you. Now just open your heart, open your life. Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. We invite you. Let his presence fill you right now. He's coming. He's moving amongst us.
More, Lord. More of your presence. More, Lord. I want to give you an opportunity to come forward. and You're receiving, I think most of you right now are receiving the presence of the Spirit as you ask and open your hearts. If you're doing that, you're receiving. You can be sure. He's at work. But if the Lord's prompting you just to come forward, just quietly come forward. I'm just going to pray over you that the Holy Spirit might fill you more this morning. So don't be embarrassed. You're asking for a really good thing from the Lord. And you can ask from where you're sitting or standing. But come so we can pray. And we can, as we sing, feel free just to come. I want to worship the Lord. Invite the Holy Spirit to rain down in our midst. And I also want to invite our ministry teams to come forward as, uh, as we're singing and just begin to pray for those quietly who come forward. Let's sing. Holy Spirit. Rain down upon us. Rain down upon us. More of you, Lord. More of your presence. Hallelujah. Come. Let's let this be a prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. And feel free to come. We want to pray for you. Just come forward. We're just going to quietly pray for more of the Holy Spirit to move in your life. And we'll pray until everyone's been received prayer. Uh, Lord, I want to ask that you will move in each of our lives here today, filling us to your spirit, with your spirit, giving us illumination to understand the gospel, to understand your word, to be empowered for ministry that you've called us to, to be empowered to live the life of Jesus. And now, we pray, Lord, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, 
according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Feel free to come forward receive prayer. Feel free to leave. Go in peace. <laughs>